Um, Did you work at nine to five while you're trying to do this too, or just kind of just went all in? No, no, this was not, this was not about that. This was, um, you know, th this was, I was all in, this was full time. I did not take a salary. I paid myself nothing. I qualified for assistance with the gas and electric company and all kinds of things. Cause I, I you know, I know you and that's what it's there for. Yeah, it's there for it. when you're struggling. Um, I, 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 I did not pay myself for the first year and um and that was horrifying too but i made sure that i paid my debt and i made sure that we grew the company i made sure my employees could eat <laughs> you know they got and then when i finally did start taking a small salary for myself the employees had direct deposit and i didn't because sometimes i couldn't cash my own check oh. welcome everybody back to another exciting show of the about that water podcast I have the awesome opportunity to bring on the show a person who is native to my home city, Baltimore, Maryland. You cannot take away the ambition that's going on there. Uh, so much stuff is happening there, and I really am looking forward to helping out the community. And by doing that, I, I have to say that um, this episode is going to be very entertaining and necessary because estate planning is not just for the rich, it is for everybody. And... So let's go on and jump right into it. How are you doing today, Derek? I'm doing great. I'm so glad to be here. We're going to have some fun and, and hopefully we'll we'll spread the message that you're exactly right. This isn't only for rich people. It's for everybody. we got to get this done. Yes. And so I, you've been doing such great things since I would say what the early what 90s, 90s. 1994. I'm 30 years at this. Don't tell anybody because I don't think I look that old, but apparently I am that old. So it's been 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. You don't look at the over 40. I, mean, I appreciate you. Good, right? Check the man. <laughs> <laughs> because it's one of the things about, uh, you know, that's scary. First off, people can't even get a thousand dollars inside their savings account, but get a loan. They are talked about, you know, retirement, mm -hmm. even estate planning. And so why is it that this is a topic that's not really talked about? Well, nobody likes to talk about their own mortality. So let's start with that. Um, and money carries so much baggage around it. People have shame about money. They have guilt about money. They have all kinds of behavioral, emotional things about money. It's taboo. It's like one of the things, it's like, it's like what don't you talk about at a party? You, you, you don't talk about politics, religion, and money. Like it's become like the trifecta. Um, and so unfortunately... Um, I, I think a lot of folks, first of all, we're not taught anything about personal finance in most schools. So as young people, we grow up watching our parents or parent talk about money or deal with money or sometimes stress about money, sometimes fight about money. And, and no one wants to talk about, well, what's going to happen when I die? And people think estate planning is only for that. There's more to it. And there are lots of things that we need to plan for once we're adult humans that we have to plan for while we're alive that people yeah. don't think about, like if you're in a car accident and you can't speak for yourself or, or, or make decisions for yourself, who's going to make them? Who's going to talk to a doctor for you? Who's going to talk to a, a bank for you or a landlord or a boss or anybody else that you need to talk to? You, you need to appoint people to speak in your stead when you can't, because it, unfortunately it happens. It happens every day. Yeah. And, but we see it on the news all the time too. So it's like, especially in Baltimore, I mean, Usually you're lucky. I mean, I'll just say for me, I was even surprised that I was able to live beyond 25. So I threw a big party when I turned 25. Did you? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, and because of that, like I've seen like, you know, being, I guess, say black in the city, it was just always mm -hmm. rough. Um, so, you know, seeing a lot of the gun violence and drugs and stuff like that, that's happening um, mm -hmm. to even think that far. And yeah. because it wasn't taught, it's now that I'm like super excited. And that's one of the reasons like my passion behind starting this podcast is because it's like, I wasn't taught this and I really mm -hmm. wish that we had more conversations about it. So how did you even start thinking about, or even come up with the conversation to, to get it started? Well, you know, I, I came across, uh, I came into this business in a very non-traditional way. I actually did go to college and I studied English and psychology, not finance. Um, because I actually think more uh, more financial decisions that get made and more of these kinds of conversations happen that are qualitative rather than quantitative. 
I think getting people to be able to speak freely and speak openly about things is really, really important. And it's less about the math. We can figure the math out later, you know? Um, and to your point, if folks are struggling, if they're paycheck to paycheck, or if they're, you know, they, they, you say robbing Peter to pay Paul, that kind of yeah. thing, then most of this feels esoteric. It feels like right now I got to worry about today. I got to worry about this Friday. I got to worry about this month. And for people in that situation, there are things that, uh, that, and they're hard. There are things that need to happen to try and pull you out of that cycle because that cycle is not going to solve itself. Yeah. And there's only two ways to improve your, your finances. You can either make more money or you can spend less money. And life is not getting cheaper. Mm. Groceries are more expensive. Gas is more expensive. Life is more expensive. So it's really important to figure out ways to make additional money. And the millennials and the Gen Zs figured out the side hustle before it was a thing. It became a thing. I take no responsibility. I'm a proud Gen Xer. We're small but mighty, and we're usually upset about everything. But nonetheless, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, the millennials and Gen Zs figured out the side hustle and figured out other ways to make money. And that is hands down the best way to pull yourself out of a cycle is to improve what the inputs are and not to spend them, not to blow them on stupid stuff. I mean, you have bills you got to pay. We all do. But there are things people do, consumerism, things people shop for they do not need. And some of them feel like status symbols. And you said something very telling, which was you didn't think you'd see 25. Yeah. You know, and I, 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 can, I can tell you that that was never something that I had to think about. Mm. And not to go down a totally different path on a totally different conversation, but that's not something I gave a lot of thought to. But if your listeners, if, if your audience... Um, and if, if, if that's something people are thinking about, the sooner you can improve your own financial status, the sooner you can improve your own social economic status. That's, it's half of it. Half of it is the money. The other half is then making good decisions. And I, you know, I'm the one to preach about it. That is a hard, hard thing. And I, and I, I, I empathize, but I, I can't, I, 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 putting myself in those shoes is almost impossible. Yeah. Try as I may, it's almost impossible. So rather than fake it, what I can say is I am not in that situation. I'm blessed not to be in that situation, but I've seen folks come out of that situation, black or white, frankly. I've yeah. seen folks come out of that situation. One of the most successful human beings I know grew up on welfare and is now a multi-million dollar attorney. It, it does work. It can happen. Mm -hmm. But so much of it is around decision making and some of it's luck. Some of it's not being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And you and I both know some of, some of this is random. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> it's random. It I is. mean, I, you can make good decisions and try and stay out of trouble and still be in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, sadly. Yeah. And they can easily drain your account, drain your emotions, and really have a huge impact inside your environment uh, to the point where you start looking at your friends sideways when it's really like they there to help you. Um, Hopefully, if they're the right friends. If they work. <laughs> Yeah, to tell you if you're wrong, you know, like you need those people. <laughs> yes, you do. You need friends who are going to be honest with you and say, knock that off. <laughs> you know, that that's part of it. Yeah. And so having those discussions, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on is because like, these are almost like the lost concepts mm -hmm. that, that we don't have. And I like that the fact that you actually started your own podcast as well, mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about it? It's uh, sure. Don't Retire, Graduate? Yeah, I, I, I've written three books, and the, the most recent one was called Don't Retire, Graduate, and I actually recorded five seasons of a podcast. Um, we're taking a year off now from the podcast because we're launching another uh, edition of the book, and so I'm sort of focusing on one thing at a time. But um, the concept is that retirement in its, in its normal form is not particularly good for you, and no one should do it. And that's counter to everything you hear every time you open the, the, the news or a website or you see, the, you see ads on TV. It's all about retirement, retirement. Reti but you got to have some reason to get out of bed every morning. you got to have something to do, purpose and vision and values. And, and so I've discovered, if you can call it that, I've discovered the three secrets to the happiest retirees. Ooh. There's three. There's three. Um, this is, uh, this is um, anecdotal, not scientific, but but – the three secrets that I have to the happiest retirees, number one, is that they're debt-free. They don't owe anybody anything. It is really, really tough to feel comfortable when you're trying to meet that, that obligation of debt. 
Um, the second one is they've taken care of themselves physically, healthy. You know, that it, it, it's you can't. It's so much easier to stay healthy than to get healthy. True. And I would argue it's easier to stay wealthy than to get wealthy too. Once you have it, the right decisions come easier, and it's easier to keep. When you don't have it, it's very tough to get. And I say health and wealth are very similar that way. So the second secret is to take care of yourself physically, nutrition and exercise and, and mental and staying out of the wrong situations. Um, and, and then third is you have to have purpose. You have to have uh, something that you look forward to every day so that you can get out of bed and make a difference, whether it's in your community, in your family, in your, uh, in your education, in your financial life, something, anything that's positive that you can get excited about because people who don't have purpose don't live very long. That's true. That's so true. So what keeps your purpose? What's your purpose? My purpose right now is to try and spread financial literacy everywhere. Yeah. Financial literacy is not taught in schools. It is not, it's not taught by parents because parents don't know it. True. You know, and half the time the parents who are working two and three jobs just to make ends meet aren't home to teach it anyway. Even if they do know it, they're not there. Um, and so making sure that people at an early age understand some of the basics, the basic ways to start to build wealth, whatever wealth is, you know, and I, I quote some, some philosophers in my book, and one of my favorites is Chris Rock. And what Chris Rock said, <laughs> Chris Rock once said that there, the difference between wealth and rich, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, if Bill Gates woke up tomorrow with Oprah's net worth, he'd want to jump out a window. Right. <laughs> so wealth is relative. So Professor Rock gave me that, and I, I quoted him in, in my book. But but it's it's true. And and understanding ways to build whatever wealth that is, even if it starts with having a positive account balance and no debt, or having debt half what it was a year ago. So I spent a lot of time in the book. The first full section of the book is really about how to avoid or get out of debt, because unfortunately, so many people are struggling with it. You know, you can get a visa card when you're 18. Mm -hmm. You can get a student loan when you're 18, and it could be huge. But no bank will lend you money to start a business nope. until you have two years of tax returns. Like, I started a company. I had to borrow from everywhere, and no bank would talk to me. But they would lend me money to go get a philosophy degree at some liberal arts school. They'd have lent me six figures. Mm -hmm. But I could put together a business plan, and they'd say, sorry, we're not talking to you. And that's insane to me. I'm they in a bit I'm not even sure where to where to, where to start with that because <laughs> it's very upsetting. Like the banks want you to do all this cool stuff. They have the ability to kind of I mean, I know it's like, you know, to borrow the money, but why hold up, you have a business plan to yeah. make the money. But yeah, for education and also the education RRI is not the same. No, it's not. Because I have an elementary education degree as my undergrad okay. and the same person that's sitting right next to me has like an engineering degree uh -huh. and it's like, we're paying the same thing, uh -huh. but yet teachers, I was, cause I was, I was doing my teaching program. I think mm -hmm. they were trying to say like, oh yeah, we can hire you as a, as a long-term sub, just kind of coming out or whatever for like a hundred dollars a day. And I was like, I would rather volunteer. Yeah. Because I was like, I make more than this as an intern when I was working for NASA. Mm -hmm. So it's like, this, <laughs> this doesn't match. Right. You can't live on it. Yeah. So how do they, I'm sorry, that's a whole nother rant, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, have at it. It's your show. Rant right. all you want. Right. <laughs> I'll try not to rant, but you rant okay. all you want. It's your show. If it's my show, I get to rant. That's the deal. Yeah. Well, I, I just hate that. Is it really grounds my gaze is, is the. The, the way how the, the federal government is actually putting out the money to kind of fund uh, private institutions to kind of get people into colleges. Yes, we were supposed to have the rat race or whatever to get to the moon and all that fun stuff. The reason why we got the education process now, but to subsidize the education to the point where you actually can give, like you said, like up to six figures just mm -hmm. for an education, the hope to get mm -hmm. a job right, and not to come trying to uh, further the economy by creating your own business. But yet the people yes. who are the business owners are the ones that get shafted all the time because you talk about pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, mm -hmm. literally, in order for you to actually make this happen. All right, let me let you in on a little secret. 
Okay. Don't tell anybody. It's just between us, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just us. Anything government's involved in will be very poorly run. It doesn't matter what level. It doesn't matter who. It's not from poor intentions. It's just that, it, particularly federally, the government is so massive, it collapses under its own weight. There is no incentive to have a balanced budget. There is no incentive to have programs be efficient. In fact, there's incentive for each department, each agency, each office to spend every penny of their budget every year for fear of losing their budget the next year that they literally spend to the last nickel. And sometimes then some. And it's the only organization in the United States that can legally print money. So if it runs short, it just makes more money, which just makes your gas $5 a gallon instead of four or three. So again, don't tell anybody, but government could louse up a bake sale. Right. All right. And that's not a political statement and it's not a rant. I reserve my rant for later, but, right. <laughs> if, but you need to rely on private sources and private industry. And you're, you're, you're hundred percent right. It, the, the ROI on education no longer makes sense. The, the cost to attend in so many cases doesn't make sense. And if you come out with an education degree, you're right. It's totally different than coming out with as an electrical engineer. Yeah. You know, or if you're going to med school or law school or, or even business school, there's, there's ways to improve the possibility of a higher income. You know, in Maryland, we boast that we have the highest per capita income in the United States. Are you feeling rich? Nope. <laughs> okay, well, but we have the highest per capita income in the United States. We also have the highest percentage of PhDs in the United States. Mm -hmm. But you know who our biggest employer is? Federal government. That is, yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 there's a, there's a, um, definitely a dichotomy here, and we could break it down, but I won't do that to your show. What I will say is there's some practical things that people can do to better their situation from go. Yeah. And I'm happy to share a couple suggestions if that would be helpful to you, things that just about everyone can grab a hold of and and make a difference with in a in a matter of a month or two or five. And it's not perfect, it's not a panacea, and none of this is neuroscience. This is all stuff we can do ourselves. Yeah, let's go for it. All right. If there was one thing that I could get people to do, it would be to pay themselves first. In other words, the first bill you pay every month is to your own financial bottom line, whether it's contributing to a retirement plan at work, whether it's putting money into an IRA or other savings vehicle, whether it's paying excess debt down. If you're in debt, the best thing you can do is get out of that. But if you collect your paychecks and then you spend money and you hope there's something left over at the end of the month, that is a treadmill you're not getting anywhere. You must figure out a way to take 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 or whatever percent of every dollar you make and put it to something that's going to grow for you. It could be a simple savings account. It could be a CD. It could be an investment account. It could be retirement. It could be debt reduction, but something that's going to make your financial life better longer term. Mm -hmm. And the people who do that, who learn to live, and it's hard. It's hard for people to live on a hundred percent of what they make. In fact, there's folks who could say, I could make 130% of what I make and it would still be hard to live. And so it, it, some of that's where the side hustle comes in. But yep. if you can get to the point where you can live on less than a hundred percent of what you make, pay yourself first and start putting money aside every check. Even if it's just direct deposit into two different accounts so that one of them is not attached to your ATM card. Seriously, yep. hide it from yourself. None of us can be trusted. It's like going into the pantry and finding the junk food. None of us reach for an apple if there's a Snickers bar. We're just not going to do it. True. So hide it from yourself. I mean, not for real, but and, and make sure that it's something that is designed for either longer term or wealth building or emergencies. Let's face it. If you suddenly need a washer and dryer or four tires for your car or your kid gets sick or something's going on, you're going to spend money. And if you have to go to MasterCard to do it, you are you are literally going backwards. That that would be if if I had one thing to get people to do, it would be that. And I've got fifty things people should do, but if I had one, that would be the first one. I will I will add on to that. Mm -hmm. um, just the education piece. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I know you said investing itself, but even if it's like a two dollars or three dollars that's going to the thrift store to buy a financial book, mm-hmm. um, like I pick up a personal finance uh, literacy like course book. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's only three dollars, but they giving you from soup to nuts of everything about finance. Like, I'll do you one better. We've got one online that's free. Oh, that's if you for. if you go to bfguniversity.com, you will find a basic financial literacy course. It's eight lessons, and it's free. You download it anytime you want. It's it's it's, it's relatively easy to understand, and it talks about everything from budgeting to savings to employee benefits to things you need to know when you're first getting started and it's free anybody who wants it can have it yeah let's let's make that out there i'm gonna definitely um add that to the show notes so right if they can just jump right into that yeah no um, it's 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 it, when you ask me what my why is what yeah. my purpose is i want to teach people how to do this and not everyone can afford a financial advisor frankly not everyone needs a financial advisor so I'm delighted to work with the people who need and can afford to work with us, but I also would like to make a difference to folks who need and can't afford to work with us. And this, these are the kind of ways we can do it, whether it's a book, whether it's an online course. Um, you know, the, the book has a workbook with it. It's on Amazon. It is not free, but it is not expensive. And it's it's 21 exercises that will build your own financial plan. And it's in a workbook and it's called Don't Retire, Graduate. And it you know, we've seen this really help a lot of people and that's, that's why I did it. And I'm not making any money on the books at the end of the day. I, I'm, I'm trying to break even on some books, but, it, but I'm, I'm trying to put something out there that will help people. Yeah. And because you're helping people, like what was your journey? Like, like why, why you go so hard on, inside the financial realm? Um, well, I will tell you, I, I grew up, um, I, I grew up in a fortunate way in that I was not in a dangerous environment or one where I didn't expect to to thrive physically, but I didn't grow up with money. I didn't grow up around money. I didn't learn about money. Um, you know, and and when I was um, when I was twenty eight years old, I was divorced. I was working for a company. I had a, a small condominium, but otherwise no money at all. And so I wound up starting this company. In 2003, I was 31. My net worth was negative. I had to borrow from everywhere because no bank would lend to me. I had no money at all. I had a business plan and a dream and an idea. And 20 years later, we employ 20 people. We have clients all over the country. And it's been, we are blessed in every conceivable way. And a lot of it came from working darn hard. But I borrowed from everywhere. I borrowed against my home. I borrowed against credit cards. I borrowed against my life insurance. I borrowed from my mom. Let me tell you something. When you borrow money from your mother, you do not want that loan shark coming after you. That is the first one I paid back. (laughs) That's true. Um, So I I borrowed money from everywhere um, and hired two people and took on a little bit of office space and said, I think we can do this. Have a plan. Let's make it work. And, you know, fast forward a couple of years and all the banks that said thank you but no thank you are tripping over themselves to work with us now. They can't wait. Here, have some money. Yeah. Well, where were you when I had none? <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so my journey was one that financially I, I, I understood I was, I was fortunate to get a college degree without loans. In and of itself, not being negative at that point was a huge, huge blessing. So whether that's done through the GI Bill, whether it's done through community college, whether it's done through scholarships or grants or, or other things, if it can be done without loans, that is a huge leg up. But the second thing is to just to just have a, a plan and work hard and and believe in yourself. Yeah. I mean, I I am I, I don't think there's nothing I do every day. That, like I said, it's not neuroscience. I'm not uh, you know, I'm not doing brain surgery. What I am doing is I'm helping people who either don't have the time or don't have the ability or just don't feel like dealing with some of these things that frankly, all of us can do for ourselves, Yeah, you know, and, um, and, and creating jobs has been, uh, has been fun. And, you know, I feel responsible for the 20 families who we employ and who rely on us and the hundreds of families who rely on us from a, a planning perspective um, and for my community and for family and everything else. And, um, so my journey was, my journeys, it's been great. It's been, I'm, I'm blessed truly, 
but it started it started kind of ugly <laughs> you know it, it started in a very for me anyway a very threatening like it was gonna this was either gonna work or not it was sink or swim oh, i wow. jumped in the deep end and said i'm gonna figure this out or not um, you work at nine to five while you're trying to do this too or it just kind of just went all in no all no this was not this was not about that this was um you know, th this was, I was all in, this was full time. I did not take a salary. I paid myself nothing. I qualified for assistance with the gas and electric company and all kinds of things. Cause I, I you know, I you. and that's what it's there for. Yeah, It's there for when you're struggling. Um, I, 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 I did not pay myself for the first year and, um, and that was horrifying too, but I made sure that I paid my debt and I made sure that we grew the company. I made sure my employees could eat, <laughs> you know, they got, and then when I finally did start taking a small salary for myself, the employees had direct deposit and I didn't because sometimes I couldn't cash my own check. Oh. So my check would sit in the drawer until, until I could cash it. But this was not, it wasn't pretty. And so people see me now and they're like, oh man, he's got it good. He's, man, what a lucky guy. Some of it's luck, but a lot of it was I, I, I crushed myself to try and make this happen. And now, yes, I'm enjoying fruits of that labor, but it took 20 years to get here. Yeah. And and a lot of people don't like to dive, like think about those hard times. But I think the hard times is where you really find yourself um, when nobody is out there, when you actually screaming for help um, in, in that darkness and you just get that one beacon of light, but like, you know, you got to reach it no matter what. So what was that beacon of light for you? Uh, I, I was very fortunate to have, um, to have mentors in my life. Mm -hmm. And I learned how to do this from another advisor about 10 years older than me, who brought me into his organization that he was growing when I was a, a young person. And I spent four years watching someone uh, almost like, like if you were a, a karate student and you'd watch the master, you just sort of watch and went, man, I can do that. Mm. It's going to take a while, but I can do that. And so I, I consider myself fortunate not only to have had employment, but to have had somebody who took a vested interest in my development. It's one of the reasons why we've built careers for people here that are so atypical. They don't exist a lot of places. You know, we're hiring young people, most of them right out of school. We hire a lot of Stevenson students. Um, because they come out of school hungry, ready to work, enthusiastic, positive. There's no silver spoons. They're like, let's, let's do this. Let's roll up our sleeves and make a difference. Um, and we'll teach them the right way. And we'll make sure that they have a competitive, compelling wage along the way. But we will teach them the right way to do this. And they never have to sell anything to anyone. You know, the problem with financial services is most people get the job and then it's, oh, you're on straight commission. You have to sell something to eat. None of our folks are paid for anything like that. They don't have to sell anything to anyone. What they have to do is learn the business, get their licenses, become great at what they do, support the organization, and then help families. And I've had people in interviews say, uh, what am I missing? This job doesn't exist. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, we have a lot of people who want to come work with us, and, and that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, and we're not growing so fast that we're hiring a lot, you know, a ton of folks. We're only 20 people, but, um, but for the folks who come on board, it's a, it's a unicorn. Yeah. And it sounds like a great place to work. I mean, like, if I didn't have my job, I'll like, <laughs> well, where's the application at the end? Yeah. Day? Yeah. <laughs> well, really cool. I think, I think it's a great place to work, but you have to ask everybody here because, yeah. you know, um, we all have good days and bad. We work hard. We work hard and there's a lot of stress. I mean, this is a stressful environment. You're dealing with people's nest eggs. You're dealing with people's money. It's a, it, it is almost as intimate as medicine. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes you have to deliver bad news and it's, it's especially difficult, but, um, but that said, um, it's incredibly rewarding too. Yeah. You know, we've, we've celebrated a lot of successes with a lot of people. So, um, bring us back to the beginning, which is the estate planning piece. So, mm -hmm. I was going on to do like a quick rapid fire of like yeah. the things that they would need in their estate plan. Um, mm -hmm. So people can go down to start today. Once they've done this show, like some action items for them. Sure. Um, most, most adult people need a total of four documents. The documents can be drafted by a lawyer or they can be done. There are online services and other things. If you work for a company that has prepaid legal, there's ways to, to access this. If, if, if your net worth starts to grow and you're becoming wealthy people, 
then you need a much more sophisticated estate plan. But some of the basics are available for people who need them. Um, and the four documents that every adult person, and by adult, I mean 18. So if you have kids who are 18, some of these things they should have. Um, the first one is an advanced medical directive. The second is a living will. These are two things that some sometimes are one document and sometimes are two. I separate them, but essentially they're the things that will name the person who can make medical decisions for you while you're alive, but can't make them. You're in that car accident. You're in a coma. You're in, uh, for whatever reason, you can't make decisions. It could be cognitive impairment. It could be anything. Um, and the second one is to give your wishes. It's really important to, to not only say, this is the person who's going to make decisions for me, and this is what I'd like them to do. Because some people want to be kept alive by machines for their, you know, for as long as it is. And some people want to be left to die comfortably and don't want, you know, some people want to leave organs to other people and to try and save other lives when it's their turn. All those things, and they're morbid. Nobody loves talking about this stuff, but we're, we're all here for a short time, you know? So those are the first two, the, the advanced directive uh, and the living will. The next is a durable financial power of attorney. The financial power of attorney is a document that names the person who can essentially sign your name if you're unable to uh, and handle things like, like your mortgage or your bills or your banking or your investments or your insurances or, or other things. And they can step into your shoes for financial decisions. And you can decide if you want to name that person to be able to do that today or if you only want to name that person in the event you are uh, incapacitated. And there's, there's different strategies. If you're married and you're in a good, healthy relationship with a spouse, you name it today. If you're naming your next door neighbor, don't do it today. You know what I mean? Like there's a difference. Um, and then the last thing is people should have a will. And the will is a very misunderstood document because people believe that it it is only about your stuff, and it's not. Um, your will talks about who's going to take care of your kids. If you have children, who's going to take care of your kids if you're gone? Who would you like them to live with? Um, and if you're leaving money behind, whether it's life insurance or other assets, who would you like to manage that for your kids? Because if you leave a five-year-old, that five-year-old can't manage their money. They can barely manage their sock drawer. So uh, so what we ought to do at that point is name somebody to take care of the money that you're leaving behind, name somebody they can live with who's going to make sure they get to school and get clothes and have a, a, as good a life as they can without you because, unfortunately, that's a tragedy. Um, the will also will name who handles your final affairs, who spends nine months of their lives making sure that all of your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted, your accounts are closed, they've closed down your Facebook account, they've closed your gas and electric bill, it, they've paid final debts. They've uh, they've paid for whatever funeral arrangements you want. All the fun stuff to talk about. Um, and the will does not necessarily handle all of your property because, of course, it's still going to say who gets what. But most of your accounts, a lot of your accounts, should have beneficiaries on them. If you have a four hundred one k at work, your four hundred one k has a beneficiary. If that beneficiary says, "I name this person," it doesn't matter what the will says. The beneficiary comes first. Your life insurance, whether it's through work or on your own, has a beneficiary. IRAs have beneficiaries. Health savings accounts have beneficiaries. You can put beneficiaries on almost any kind of account you can think of. You can put them on bank accounts. You can put them on investment accounts. You can put them on your car. The Motor Vehicle Administration allows you to name a beneficiary for your car. What? Really? Truly. It's called TODI. It's transfer on death individual, and it allows you to name a beneficiary so that if you don't have a will or you have a will, but you want to be able to change something easily, you can put a beneficiary designation on almost anything. Okay. Now that was new. I heard about the rest of them. I didn't know about the car. Yeah. Well, and it's state by state. Maryland allows it. Some states don't. Maryland allows it, and of course, it's not free because the DMV has to charge you a fee for something. I think it's $35 or something. But whatever it is, if you, you know, we encourage married couples not to own cars jointly because okay. it creates liability for them. So if you're in a, a two-income household, you have a car in your name, your spouse has a car in, in your spouse's name, and then um, you want to make life easy when one of you is widowed, you just put a beneficiary and name each other on it. Didn't I know that? All right. I'm, to well, I'm glad I could teach you something. We've been yeah. at this 40 minutes. Let's learn something. <laughs> no, let's learn. <laughs> and you thought you knew everything. Well, I, I don't know everything. That's the no, reason I why I have guests on the show. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and that would be a one man show. <laughs> yeah, I understand. I don't know everything either, by the way. I'm not even close. Yeah, well, this is but this is the reason why I have uh, guests like you on the show because it's like we we go through our lives and we try to figure out like what is the best option for us and mm-hmm. personal finance is personal but some of the times we think that we are doing the right thing mm-hmm. because we heard somebody else say that's the way to do it yeah but not knowing the intricacies behind it and also the limitations uh about it because like everybody will say like go ahead on and buy a house but what if home ownership isn't really for you like it's- you know it's definitely not for everyone. Yeah. House is a horrendous investment. <laughs> it's a horrendous investment. If you're going to live in it, it's different if you're buying rental properties and you can make money on the property. Mm-hmm. But if you're buying a house to live in, it's a money pit. It is. And I own a home and I'm not telling folks not to, but don't do it because you think it's going to make you money. It is going to cost you money every day. Every day. Because like now I got to put new shutters up because right. the shutters fell down because of the wind. <laughs> right. Like, and and you'll put the shutters up and then you'll realize something has to get painted or you've got a hole in your foundation or you need a driveway or a roof or whatever it is. You need new bushes in the front yard. Whatever it is, there will always be something. Mm-hmm. It will always cost you money. You will not get most of that back when you sell the place. Mm-hmm. A house is a horrendous investment. That's not to say there aren't periods of history where people have sold real estate for a lot more than they bought it for. But buying real estate as an investment is completely different than buying a house to live in. I look at it more so like your vehicle, like because you own it is there. You don't plan to get rid of it. You know, you don't make money on it. It helps you. I mean, obviously, it keeps the roof over your head. It makes you comfortable. It makes life a little comfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately uh, what I look at. It's not like a a financial thing. It's psychology. It's your nest. It, it, I'm not saying don't own a home. I'm saying don't look at the mortgage payment on the house yes. and a rent payment and assume that it's the same number. Therefore, it's the same. It is not the same. Yeah. And most people deduct their mortgage interest and their real estate taxes and so forth. And right now, with the standard deduction being so high, and we haven't talked about taxes, but most people don't even itemize on their taxes anymore, which means they're not using Schedule A, which means they're not even deducting some of the things that are deductible because they don't have enough deductions. 90% of the United States does not itemize anymore, which means things that you're being taught are, have some tax savings to them might not. So, you know, be aware of that. I mean, I would sooner, I would sooner do my own root canal than do my own tax return. (laughs) I know people do it. Um, and if it, if your world is simple enough that TurboTax or Jackson Hewitt or H&R Block can solve it, that's great. But when your world starts to get complicated, you need a CPA. And when your world starts to get complicated, that's when you look at a financial advisor or other folks, when you've reached a certain level where it's now complicated beyond what you want to do by yourself. Yeah. Oh, man. All right. Um, we, let's, let's go on and go to the third segment because I can sit here and just pick your brain all day. Well, like, like I said, <laughs> I'm very expensive. I'm billing you for this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make sure we get all the free resources. Make sure yeah, guys, but I got more. Book. I got I got plenty of free resources. <laughs> we do. We have plenty of free resources out there. I can point you to a number of them. Um, and you know, BFG, we have a university, which is the online course, and one of them is free. We have a, a library of resources that has five or six different white papers that are free about taxes or buying your first home or other things. There are resources everywhere. If you go to our website and you look up BFG Library, and the website is bfgfa.com. And then you can find all these resources, podcast episodes, uh, articles, and, and the vast majority of it is free. And that's one thing I, I really like about your program, that you keep in low-cost entry. And as, at this point, I feel like if you have to older than 30 and you're listening to this, there's no excuse to, to not get yourself in the financial um, mindset, I will say, because you got to start somewhere. And then you start changing your environment around it. Yeah. Um, And, and you can be a good example for your kids. Yeah. You know, kids, kids are watching everything we do, everything. So I don't know if you're a father or not, but, but if you have kids, you're not, then you have no idea. We we didn't plan on having kids. There's a reason why I need a podcast to kind of, this is my baby. 
oh, this is your baby? Well, this yeah. this baby doesn't keep you up at night and spit up in your lap, but <laughs> um, and it doesn't need to go to college or anything else. Yeah. But but when you have kids, kids watch what we do, and they learn from it, even if we don't mean to be teaching. And so we have to sort of check ourselves a little bit and make sure that we're we're handling things the right way. Yep. And with that being said, mm-hmm. on to the third segment, which is the futures. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so what skills or habits that you feel that will take you to the next level uh, in your journey? You know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually still in school. <clears throat> I've been in school my entire life. So I, I'm always in a, a different programs. I'm, I'm taking a... Um, a course in philanthropy right now because mm-hmm. I'm trying to to learn at a much higher level ways in which nonprofits can can do fundraising and benefit from the generosity of donors and and some of the strategies that work that can help not only from a tax perspective but but from a charitable perspective. So I'm having fun with that. Uh, I'm also looking at courses um, on facilitation and doing some group. Uh, group meetings. I started a, a consulting practice. My retirement plan, which is to never retire, obviously I'm going to graduate, but my retirement plan is instead of doing day-to-day financial advising, it's to do more consulting and coaching and mentoring and teaching and volunteering and to continue to grow the company. We've got incredible people here doing great work. Um, and I, I'm trying to, to do more of a one-to-many than a one-to-one. Like, where can I make an impact and reach as many people as possible? And that's one of the reasons why I enjoy these podcasts, because you're reaching an audience I might not otherwise reach. And I, I hope I've made a difference. If it's in, in one person's life, it's been a good morning. That's all we need. Good morning. Right. <laughs> I like that. I, you know, yeah. make one person's day better, and it's been a good day. Yeah. It'd be nice if somebody did that for me today, too, if, you're, if you'd like. But right. well, well, good morning <laughs> to you. Too. Yeah, I appreciate you. <laughs> appreciate you. <laughs> Uh, uh, is there anything else you want to say before we dive into the final four questions? Uh, no, let's, let's do it. Let's do the final four. I'm ready. I like the final four. All right. Number one, what does wealth mean to you? Freedom. Mm-hmm. Wealth means the independence and the freedom to be able to, to choose, um, and not to have so many have tos. I like that. That actually might be the title of the show. (laughs) Oh, well, well, there you go. Right. Uh, Number two. Yeah. What was your worst money mistake? My God, how much time do you have? Um, My, 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 actually, I I will tell you that my, probably my worst money mistake was um, getting caught up in the late nineties in some of the dot com in excitement and enthusiasm and thinking I was going to buy individual securities and individual stocks and that that was going to be part of my plan. Um, and I had some financial education and still messed that up royally. And I learned, an ex- I learned an expensive but important lesson, which was not to do that, not to try and time anything, not to try and guess. You know, now it's about owning everything and not trying to time or guess at, at anything. So I, I learned a lesson. I learned it in the grand scheme of things, pretty cheaply, thank you, thankfully, because I was young and dumb. But uh, for people who, who are trying to do that, and, and I, I watched the, the nonsense with Reddit and GameStop and all this craziness, and I would stay out of that fray, and, 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 and uh, crypto and all, I stay out of the fray. It is, um, it is a loser's game. All right. That's a whole nother show now. Yeah. No, I know. I know. <laughs> Number three. Yeah, number three. Which is, what is your favorite financial or non-financial book? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, And I will tell you that my favorite, I I have two. They're both non-financial, but they both border on who I am and what I do. Okay. The first is what I still consider to be the greatest book ever written, which is Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. That book, while it's a heavy read, it's a lot of economics, it's a lot of philosophy, it's a narrative, um, and it's an incredibly powerful, and, and you can agree or disagree with some of the sentiments in it, but it's a very powerful book. And so it's the kind of thing I can read over and over again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the second is one that a lot of us read in middle school and not since, which is The Catcher in the Rye. Mm-hmm. Catcher in the Rye, if you'll recall, is uh, about a, a young man, a troubled young student, who's trying to, to figure out 
what he's going to do. And one of the things is about him trying to protect people who are falling, trying to catch them, like literally standing on the edge of a cliff to protect people and feeling like that person. Um, and there's a quote in that book by the kid's teacher, Holden Caulfield's teacher, Mr. Antonelli. And I've used this quote on all of my social media stuff because I think it's the most powerful thing ever. And the quote is this, the mark of an immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause. The mark of a mature man is that he wants to live humbly for one. That one is a good one. That's really good. That's 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 why I would say there's plenty of fi finance books out there, but give me philosophy first because mindset and philosophy will will beat up it, it's kind of like when, when you think about athletics or performance or other things hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work yep. it's mindset and so I, I think from a financial standpoint it's it's mostly mental yeah because I, I was looking at another podcast and they were actually talking about like justifying themselves to to take a vacation and I'm like yeah. depends on how you feel I mean, it's well, like you could use the money for other things if you want to. Well, and what's important to you? Yeah. You know, my mother-in-law always says the wolf that grows is the wolf you feed. And True. what she means by that, for better or for worse, is that where you expend your energy and where you spend your, whether it's positive or negative, where you spend your energy, that is what grows. That is what, um, what expands in you. And whether it expands for good or expands for not good, that depends what you've chosen. We need to have like a philosophy talk to you after this. Like, <laughs> okay, but it's over a single malt scotch. Got you. All right. Since you're local, we can make it happen. Yeah, all right. I'm in. Uh, yeah. Number four. Yep. Uh, what is your favorite dish to make? My favorite dish to make? Yeah. I mean, reservations. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a breakfast expert. Okay. So I, I if, if it involves breakfast food, if it involves... An omelet, I can crush it. If it involves, you know, making blackened chicken at night, I usually set off the fire alarm and I'm thrown out of my own kitchen by my wife. I'm you not a blackened chicken, though. <laughs> I can't do it. Well, it's blackened. It's blackened. You could break a window with it, but it's blackened. Um, so, no, I am not a good cook. Um, I, I'm not a good cook. I, I can make breakfast food and I can grill because I have my man cart. I can grill. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, you don't want me in the kitchen. Sounds good. Yeah. It's funny that most of the guys on the show, they always say breakfast. I'm a yeah. breakfast guy myself. It's like, you know, whip some eggs up, uh, yeah. some pancakes, some bacon or sausage, whatever. And, hey, we good. Throw a bowl of cereal. Yeah. And and, and maybe some fruit so that we're, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. so we can live longer and healthier. But yeah, other than that, um, if it's breakfast, I can do it. If it's, I mean, I, I literally have set off the fire alarm in the house. It's horrendous. So I've I've given up. And my favorite thing to make for dinner is definitely reservations. There you go. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Eric, this was uh, an amazing time. I, I had to cannot thank you enough for everything that you've been doing, definitely for the community and definitely for the whole town of Baltimore. Um, you know, I, and I think that this conversation can resonate for a lot of people. And I think this will be one that people can actually have you know, just as say cooking breakfast or mm -hmm. cooking, you know, lunch and dinner and, and have that open discussion. So um, if you could just let people know where they can find out more about you and how sure. they can get in touch with you. Sure. Um, I mentioned the website, which is bfgfa.com. Um, and I'm also, we're all over social media. If you go to, to Brotman Media or Brotman Consulting Group, I mean, you'll, you'll find us. We are, thanks to my, my marketing guru, Sarah, who we talked about offline, uh, we're every place. But, um, but I would start there, and there are resources, uh, and you can get some, some free courses, some free materials. Um, and then, of course, you know, if, if the book appeals to you, it's on Amazon or any place else you buy books, and that's the book and the workbook combo, too. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, again. So if you listen to this, make sure you go ahead on and uh, on YouTube, go ahead on my like and subscribe. If you're listening to this on podcast, make sure you share this with somebody and leave a comment. I like to read those and definitely the five star comments. I like seeing those. They actually get popped up everywhere and get a shout out. So those are pretty cool. 
All right, everybody. I'm out. Peace.